now we start a new phase in the course uh, with many invited professors. And today we start the course of Joshua White and, and his postdocs uh, that will be here for the next four weeks. Uh, and I hope you enjoy a lot. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Joshua White. Uh, Joshua is a physicist by training and he got his bachelor degree from Princeton University in the US and later a PhD in physics from MIT, also in the United States. And currently, Joshua is a professor at Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, we call this Georgia Tech. And there, Joshua is the director of the Interdisciplinary Quantitative Biosciences grad program. So I think many of you might be interested in this kind of program, so check it out. Um, as some of you, Joshua started his career in very classic physics problems, um, but at some point, for our luck, he decided to study biological problems and try to understand mainly viruses and their dynamics um, before the pandemic and everything. And today he's one of the leading references in virodynamics at all scales, molecular, population, and evolutionary scales. Um, and to finish this introduction, uh, I invite you to take a TV. I told the students last year, and they didn't regret, so I tell you again, check the kind of uh, students that Joshua has been uh, advising during his career. He had like many, many, many students from the most diversity background, so it's very impressive and very inspiring. Uh, I hope you all enjoy a lot this course. I think it's the most evolutionary one uh, in our program, and I'm suspect, but evolution is amazing, so I think you will love it. Uh, and I think you can now uh, join me to welcome Joshua White. Thank you, Flavia. Can you all hear me? Am I still not yes. sure if you can hear me? <laughs> yes? That's a yes? Yes. Okay, good. And it looks like most people are in the room. There's one person here I see uh, joining remotely. So if there's any issues, you can give me a, a sign because I can probably see that because I can't see the faces of those in the room. Sorry, I can't be there this morning to join you. I've been there in years past, pre-pandemic. And hopefully Jacobo Marchi is somewhere in the audience and is now waving his hand and he'll be introduced in a moment. And after that, Stephen Beckett will come too. So let me just give a little bit of, of context because today I'm going to start the course going. And in doing so, I wanna give you a little context of where it comes from. Obviously your days are gonna be packed. You have an hour and a quarter in the morning, then a break and then another hour and a quarter or so. Uh, and then you have class in the afternoon. So I know it's a busy sequence. And at Georgia Tech, part of what I'm gonna be doing today and what uh, Jacopo and Stephen will be doing over the next month or so is based on a course that I developed called Foundations of Quantitative Biosciences. And it is meant to be a broad introduction to thinking about models of living systems across scales, as Flavia mentioned, from molecular and cellular scales, organismal scales, to population community scales. But because we have a limited time together and there's been a bit of a more of a focus I'm going to try to center the introduction today on foundations of ecological and evolutionary concepts. And just to point out that your lead instructors will be Dr. Jacobo Marchi and Dr. Stephen Beckett, both of which have taught in this course uh, at Georgia Tech. And Jacobo has been here in past years in Sao Paulo to teach in the course so that we're familiar with this kind of audience, this kind of group, and hopefully you get a lot out of it and, and Jacopo and Stephen have a lot of fun in working with all of you over the next month. So just to give you all a little bit of a background on what we do, this is a snapshot from our website and you can, it's, it's easier to find it. It's whitesgroup.biosci.gatech.edu. You can just, as my uh, son says, search it up or Google it up. And we work on a number of areas. In the past, we did work on plant networks many, many years ago, but these days we work on virus dynamics at all scales, a mix of viral ecology, in other words, viruses of microbes and epidemiology, viruses of humans, predominantly SARS-CoV-2 over the past few years for various reasons, uh, but not only. And our group has a number of folks in it. We're a large team from all over the world, 
uh, right now we have people from Europe, Mexico, Asia, uh, the US and beyond. And if anyone after this month or during the course of the month wants to learn more about this program, I encourage you to reach out. And I hope that you think of these interactions with faculty, whether remote or in person, or the scientists as an opportunity for you all to get a, a sense of what goes on in international institutions and what it may be like to do a PhD abroad or even uh, in Brazil or in South America, but in collaboration with individuals who may be abroad. So just to give you a flavor of some of the folks in the group. I'm, well, there you are. Hello, everyone. I can see you. Oh, yeah, look, yeah. Hey, good morning. So I'm somewhere around here in Atlanta, Georgia. And that's what it would look like if I was flying in a drone, I guess. That's a shot of our Midtown area. And if I was on a drone right on campus, this is one of our old buildings called Tech Tower. So we're an urban campus, a little bit like, yours, though it's a bit of a different layout. You see there's a lot of trees. Atlanta is a very uh, green leafy city, so we have a lot of tree density even in the midst of this uh, urban area. So that's sort of where I'm from, but now let me get into what I'm hoping you all will get out, uh, both of this course, but also hopefully more broadly in, in your broad set of courses. At Georgia Tech, when we do Foundations of Quantitative Biosciences, I try to organize each of the themes around modules, and you're going to get a taste of a few modules in which you will understand key advances in the biosciences. Some of these may be foundational from a long time ago. Some of them may be more recent, right? Because we're still learning and discovering things. And in each case, we've tried to select these advances in which they were enabled in part by quantitative methods and reasoning. And in each one of the modules, you're really going to learn three things, and that's going to be our goal and mantra in some sense over the next month. We want you to learn methods, logic, and computational skills, meaning we're going to expose you to the necessary biology, but knowing you have a very diverse background, some of for you, the biology, you'll get it, and some of it, it may be new, but we want to make sure you have some of the tool sets to understand and analyze quantitative models. How do you translate mechanisms into models? And then how do you actually reason through them? How do you figure out which one of these different mechanisms could explain the data you see? And that really is the practice of how we engage in science. Right? We develop a theory or we develop a model, no matter how beautiful it may be, we need to compare to experiment and observation. And if there's a gap, if it's wrong, we need to revise. It means we've missed something in that initial idea. Much of what we do though, in biology when we're analyzing living systems is not something that we end up solving on pencil and paper. So we need to translate it, translate this model into a computational model, implement it and start to use it to help build our intuition. And as you will see, both Jacobo and Steven, based on courses we developed here at Tech, there are going to be traditional lectures, somewhat interactive, there'll be pauses for you to interact and work together. But in each case, there'll be a third component, which is a laboratory component, a computational lab where you're gonna be doing coding. And my understanding, and if you all can nod a little bit, I think you've done some basic coding already. We're not starting from zero, we're in the middle. Is that right? Can I get some thumbs up? You've done some coding already. And just so we have a sense, I think already it's, who is gonna be programming mostly in Python? And who would prefer programming in R? Okay. And does anyone do, want to do MATLAB? Is that something too? One or two or three. Okay. So Jacopo, we'll, uh, we need to do a little discussion later just to make sure we have all the right uh, code bases. But you can program in any one of those languages. I'll get into them. There'll be varying levels of support, but you can support each other. The core ideas will be there. Some of the syntax support you can get from each other. Okay, and we're going to try to use these skills at different scales, as you'll see, even in our smaller module that we're going to do over the next month, we'll still get to look at different scales of biology. And again, the overall objective of what we try to do in Foundation of Quantitative Biosciences is to teach you how to reason quantitatively given uncertainty. So how do you think and develop methods and logic, but in light of uncertainty, you may not be sure of the mechanism, something fundamental, maybe some rates maybe even the reliability of measurements. There are going to be a lot of measurements error. 
And finally, of course, you can do it. So I want to just make sure to implore you over the next month that this will be interesting. It should be challenging. And you're going to learn more if you do it on your own, meaning like, yes, I want you to talk to your neighbor and I want you to work in small groups, but you should have a laptop. You should be coding. So you should be developing that intuition and it's best done in a group setting, but ultimately you don't want to just be a passive onlooker or bystander watching someone else code. We want to make sure that each one of you can do it and we think it's accessible to each. So how are we going to get there? And just more broadly, you're going to learn over the course, hopefully, of your career on many different things, we're going to focus on this last section at scales of populations and ecosystems. And in doing so, we're going to try to make sure that you get to read a little bit of background on papers. We'll make sure to have papers associated with each module, get a chance to discuss them, simulate living systems, and compare models to data. So in practice, we're hoping to make sure that you have a sense of what the problems are, why they're interesting, what the data and observations are that need explaining, and then over the course of each one of these modules to build it up. And you know, it's very early here. There's a joke I was going to tell about mathematical biologists, and it involves sheep. And it was funny, but it's like 7.10 and I've had no coffee, so I'm going to mess it up. Imagine it was a funny joke about sheep. And the punchline is that the shepherd knows that it's a mathematical biologist because he took a dog instead of a sheep at the end. And you're all very confused and that's fine and shaking your head. It was bad if I tell the whole thing, it's even worse. So be thankful I didn't even do it. So I wanna say more about what is the typical approach to mathematical biology. This has been our experience, especially in interdisciplinary audiences is that you have you on the left and faced with a board and there's nothing more tempting to do as a, as a professor than just to write a lot of stuff on the board. I, it makes me very happy just writing the board and I've been there before. You've got great board set up. You can pull them up and down and you can use three boards. There can be the risk though that it is overdone and you're left on the right-hand side, right? A little bit confused at a certain point, losing the thread. So we don't want that to happen. We want to do that. And you'll see I haven't lost the board. It's there. But I've put in the foreground a little bit more coding. So I want to make sure that you all have a sense to feel empowered uh, and essentially using computational skills that you already have in place to try to understand what's going on in this living system and make sense of scales, whether it's at the individual viral scale, the population scale, even community scales. And you'll see, we'll start off with questions really at this question of individual, what should they do or not, depending on what the others might do, how do populations work together, how can there be feedback? And then we'll get into the last section in outbreaks. You should feel some confidence that this is going to work. We've done it before. We first tried it out in fall 2016 when I founded the program at Georgia Tech with a small cohort of nine very brave students from very different backgrounds, everything from really applied physiology to engineering, computing, physics, and ecology. And it was in that course that we sort of began this practice of alternating between the, the models and mechanisms and theory side and in, uh, instantiating it in laboratories on a weekly basis. We had then expanded it to give people who were in our program a taste of it. That was in short courses, which are these hands-on modeling workshops, including those with zero experience. And it worked. By the end, people had their own models of stochastic gene expression. And we kept doing this, and we now do it every year. So if you happen to be in the U.S. in a future year and you want to come visit, we do these two-day workshops. It's a short period of time each May. And in 2018, we ran one on evolutionary dynamics. On May 2019, on microbial games, inspired by the work of local colleagues, Peter Yunker and Will Radcliffe, who this is really an image of some of their work. Look at these uh, type 6 secretion system killing systems wh where you have nearby neighbors that end up bacteria stabbing each other, but they don't kill like, and so they end up leading 
to very interesting pattern formation that emerges from this individual behavior. And then of course, things changed. And for a couple of years, we had to run these courses strictly online because of the pandemic, but we still did. And in fact, had a much larger attendance because we were able to do it online. And in May, 2022, we went back in person to a stochastic gene expression. There's going to be one upcoming in May, 2023 on molecular dynamics. So we've talked, we've touched on a lot of topics, some at the molecular and cellular scales, all the way up to uh, evolutionary problems, epidemic problems. And we continue to refine the modules, including the ones that you'll be using. So obviously we welcome the feedback. And if at any point, obviously during the lectures, but also with the laboratories, you see issues with them, or you have a question about them, or you think they could be modified in some way, feel free to let Jacopo and Stephen know. And obviously I'm happy to hear as well. Okay. This is the program writ large, just so you have a context. I've been spending some time introducing the program, but it gives you a sense that you are a part in a way of this program now. You have a sense of what's going to go on, not just in this month, but a part of a practice of, of training of PhDs in the US. Uh, and to give you one final sense of, of what's happened to some of the folks, these are two of our most recent graduates, Pedro Marquez Zacarias and Daniel Moratori. Pedro worked with Rural Ratcliffe, a colleague. Daniel was a, a student in my group. Both are now Omidyar postdoctoral fellows at the Santa Fe Institute. They only selected three this year, two of which came from our program. So we're very proud of them. And we have other folks we're equally proud of who've gone into different kinds of careers. So we hope that the training you're getting in terms of really problem-based learning and hands-on training helps you no matter where you decide to go. And these are just three examples from our inaugural class, one of whom has gone on to a more policy position in the Center for Disease Control, the other into a data science job, a senior role at uh, Deloitte managing a data science team, and another is now working at a postdoc at Oak Ridge National Labs, uh, just north of us in Tennessee. Okay. And I can't see all of your reactions, and I know we're just getting started here. I can't imagine there are that many questions, and I don't see hands raised, but Flavia, you'll interrupt me if there's a question. Yet, yeah. are there questions? Not yet. Yes, that's okay. I didn't expect there would be at this stage. So just to give you a sense of where uh, you're going to get the material from, and I'll work with Jacopo and Stephen to make sure you, you get this, you're going to get a series of lecture notes. These lecture notes are part of a book that is in the process of being produced. It's uh, well past under contract. Now it's in press and now the editor has it, but uh, there's a global paper shortage and other things and supply chain stuff still because of the pandemic. So I hope it will come out later this year, maybe early 2024. And it's entitled Quantitative Biosciences, Dynamic Across Cells, Organisms, and Populations. We're going to be focusing on this population side. You will also get computational labs. And I'll let Jacopo introduce the format there when you first do it. But as a capstone element to each one of the sections, you will get a chance to put the ideas into practice. And we have these labs programmed in MATLAB, Python, and R. Most of you use the Python and R. We have a student version and an instructor version. So you will get the answers. No matter what, you, we will make sure you get across. This is a course. We want to make sure you, you understand the basic concepts. And our practice is to give you the student version without the answers so that during the class session, you have a chance to work on things, but making sure that you have available the instructor copy just so that you can then work through uh, and make sure that you really understand how these things work. I think, Flavia, in the past, you've used Slack. I think, I hope, you haven't changed it. Uh, you have access, right? Also on Drive. Google Drive and Slack. Okay, well, I will talk to you and, and Jacobo to make sure we organize it in the next day or so to, to make sure all the pieces are together so that you'll have the notes, the lecture notes, the labs, and any other papers we want you to read. And just to point out, there's a lot of other, many other very good books in this space. If you like the mathematical ideas underlying some of what you're going to be taught, Steve Strogatz's book, Nonlinear Dynamics and Chaos, a classic, still a classic. 
Two examples I think are quite nice in terms of programming the MATLAB and Python. There are a lot of our books out there, but these are two particularly nice ones for MATLAB and Python. And only because the, the lecture notes and labs are meant to be part of a book, please don't share the material online. So they're for your use as part of this class. Okay, so I mentioned before uh, that the use of quantitative methods has actually been very core to biology from the very start. And this goes back in the upper left, there's an image of Max Delbruck and Salvador Luria. And we'll get back to Delbruck and Luria, I'm sure later on. And maybe I'll just ask, has anyone ever heard of the Luria Delbruck experiment? Is that only one or two, very few. Okay, I'll talk to Stephen about introducing that idea in the class. It's a experiment meant to probe the very basis of mutations, whether they're dependent or independent on selection, and involves viruses, bacteriophage, infecting a bacteria that should die, they're all susceptible, but Delbrook and Luria realized that not all of them did because there was something called resistance, and the number of resistant colonies that were grown in agar plate told a very interesting story about the mechanisms by which those bacterial cells became resistant. So that's just a prelude to something that then happened much later. They end up winning the Nobel Prize. And the basis for it really was this mathematical way of describing fluctuations. Now, often when people are taught, and I realize in this audience, maybe it seems like very few of, of you have heard about it before but you're not usually taught the mathematical side that underlies it. The same applies to gene expression, like work by Minot. Whenever you use BLAST, there's beautiful mathematical ideas underlying sequence comparison and evolutionary theory, and obviously anything in neuroscience and signal processing, uh, the mathematical ideas of Hodgkin and Huxley. But we can also think about quantitative methods in population ecosystem scales. I've given two examples of folks who've done influential work, Jane Lubchenco and Simon Levin. And I just want to give you a taste of it in today's class, really as sort of a motivation for the more detailed lectures to come. So the example I'll draw is an old one, one I hope you're familiar with. That way it can reinforce certain ideas you may already have. And that is what is popularly known as the Laca Volterra model of predator prey dynamics. And I, I assume that most people have heard of that. Is that yes? Yes. Okay, good. It's hard to be as interactive. I'm, I'm, I'm in Georgia. I, for all you know, I'm in a drone somewhere flying around campus. Uh, but hopefully, we'll, when Jacopo starts going tomorrow, feel open and willing to jump in at any point. So Vito Volterra is an Italian mathematician. Alfred Laca is an American physicist. And Volterra, interesting enough, was convinced by his son-in-law, Umberto Dancona, to examine fluctuations of Adriatic fisheries. The idea was that during World War I, there were these oscillations in the amount of fish that were caught. And the question became whether or not that was because of some exogenous change. Maybe there was some changes in temperature over the course of a couple years or other sort of effects, or could fluctuations in the amount of fish that were caught in uh, by fishermen be a reflection of something fundamental to the system? Could it be that the system itself, without any external driver, could lead to oscillations? I mean, could it destabilize itself as a feature of the feedback between fish at different scales, the predators and the prey? And what Volterra proposed, similar to Latka, was a coupled system of differential equations. In other words, thinking about populations of predators and prey as being coupled and changing in time. And this is the original model developed by Voltaire and Lagka, and we will go into this in more detail and treat it in a more modern way, but I just want to give you the introduction. Here we have a couple sets of what are called nonlinear differential equations. And I'm really alluding to this today. We will go over this in detail, and Stephen Beckett will go over in full detail in his lectures. And here, X represents the prey, 
and y represents the predator. And what you can see is that the left-hand side denotes the change of this population x with respect to time of the prey and of the predators dy dt. And you will see that if there were no predators around, if y were zero, then dx dt would just be ax. What happens if we have some population like dn dt equals rn? What does it do? You can make a shape in the air if you want. Goes up exponentially, which is not very realistic because exponentials get big very fast. And usually you would imagine there would be some carrying capacity, but in this simple model, there was this growth and it was balanced by predation. Imagining that the predators and prey as individuals come into contact at some rate and with some rate of contact, there's an uptake or consumption leading to the production of new predator biomass, this DXY. So we have BXY, which is loss, and the predators can grow proportion to the availability of prey. In the absence of prey, if X were zero, the predators would die exponentially. DY, DT would be minus CY. In other words, they would go down. Together, neither an exponential growth or decay happens. What happens is something more interesting. You end up getting cycles. There's a weird feature of these cycles, and the cycles are shown here with time implicit. It is meant to go counterclockwise here, where prey is on the x-axis, predators on the y-axis. And if you start here at a prey maximum, then at a time when prey are replete, the predators start to consume them, leading to a decrease in prey. I hope that you can see this mouse. Is, is that seeable? Good. Right here. And when the predators are at a maximum and there are less prey, then they start to decrease. And finally, at a point when the predators start to decrease in number, the prey recover, but there's still too few prey for the predators to increase until a certain point where there's enough prey. And now the, both the predators and the prey increase. This cycle is called a Locke Volterra like cycle, counterclockwise in this plane. But if I had started with different initial conditions, I would get a totally different cycle. The technical reason is that this system has a Hamiltonian, it conserves this crazy quantity, which means that the system remembers its initial conditions forever. Some of you are physicists. Some of you probably know that Hamiltonians are very good. It helps you do a lot of stuff. In biology, it usually means something has gone wrong. There's no reason for the system to remember its initial conditions forever. So these are not really a limit cycle. They're structurally unstable. If you start with initial condition, you will end up never overlapping, never seeing the other line again. But it did begin to explain how and why a system, even the absence of any exogenous drivers, could lead to intrinsic fluctuations and oscillations. Okay, That was the core idea. Now, as it turned out, these kind of models can be tweaked. Right, And they can be tweaked. I think you can probably imagine if we don't assume that dx dt is x times a, but maybe it's something like ax 1 minus x over k, or dn dt is rn 1 minus n over k. I know I'm just saying a lot of letters in the air, but if there were a carrying capacity, or if it took some time for the predators to handle the prey. This is an instantaneous conversion of prey biomass into predator biomass. When you start to include these other features, you can recover what's called a limit cycle, where in the, irrespective of where the system begins, you end up converging and having oscillations. This is an empirical example, a classic links hair time series. This is the links, this is the hair. This eats this, as you can imagine. 
this data set actually comes from a, a collection of skins and hair and links traded by a Hudson Bay company, largely Canadian uh, furring company. What you can see is that the peaks of hair tend to precede increases in that of links. Do you notice they all seem to be either close to or a little bit right shifted? This is a theme, and this is what you might imagine when you have a prey peak, followed by a predator peak, followed by a prey minimum, followed by a predator minimum, and then this repeats. So you, despite the fluctuations here, maybe the fluctuations themselves are interesting, but you end up getting this kind of limit cycle-like behavior. And you can see this actually in bacteria and phage as well, something that we will get back to later in the course. So this can be a property of macroscopic systems, but also more microscopic predators and prey or hosts and parasites. Volterra did a lot of things, as did Lodka. Not just this Lodka Volterra model for which most people know them, but also integral equations, many other contributions that really sit at the base of how do we integrate mathematical models into our studies of living systems. The problem and the danger can be is if we look at these formulas as being sacrosanct, idealized and not to be touched, and this is an old cartoon, hopefully you can see it, formula appreciation class at the math museum, right? And if we venerate these things and we don't think that they can be changed, that can lead to a nice branch of mathematics, but we lose the feedback to biological reality. And what we're trying to do in this R module is to teach you about science, the scientific method through the lens of quantitative ecology and evolution. Okay. And although there's lots of reasons to admire and like mathematics, there are a lot of problems at all scales that require your help. I mean, you have a role to play in the doing of science. In this upper left corner, although I put it in molecules and genes, it's only partly a molecule and gene problem. This is the projected number of deaths attributable to antibiotic uh, resistance or anti uh, multi drug resistance amongst microbes by 2050. There's a very classic O'Neill review. And the numbers here begin to uh, challenge those of things like certain cancers. We're talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions per year fatalities if we are no longer able to use standard antibiotics to treat what would otherwise be treatable infections. And the reason we have this question of treatability is not just because we can't develop certain drugs, but because the microbes that we're using the drugs against, these pathogens, are evolving resistance, in part precisely because we're using antibiotics and not just to treat pathogens, but often in agricultural settings as a means to accelerate growth of livestock, with a secondary consequence being selecting for antibiotic-resistant microbes that then spread back to us. Obviously, questions of sequences and evolution are paramount. This is an example from the Ebola virus disease outbreak of trying to estimate introductions of a pathogen into a new country based on sequence comparisons and trying to find the last common ancestor or the most recent common ancestor uh, of a particular group of sequences that have been taken from individuals. The work that was done in response to Ebola became the basis for the genetic sequencing approaches and the accelerated approaches in response to SARS-CoV-2 not only to sequence and get and identify the spike protein so quickly after it was first identified so that work on vaccines could start as early as Jan, Feb, 2020, but also to begin to understand how the disease spread, learn more about asymptomatic transmission and symptomatic transmission, and also get a sense uh, 
of ways in which different kinds of controls could imprint themselves as new variants arose, as early warning indicators. And the work there is not just about observation, but also about integrating mathematical models like phylogenetic models and epidemic models into the very basis of public health response. There are other topics that I won't cover today that are fascinating about signaling and behavior. And there can be other kinds of interesting uh, behavioral problems at collective scales. The brain and neuroscience problems are, are terrific ones. I know we're on quantitative ecology in this course, but you will at least get a chance to understand how different kinds of behaviors can function when individuals are connected and when groups come together and groups can end up having behaviors that are very different than that of the individual, that are really a reflection of emergent properties that you can only see when that group is together. And then finally, there are, are questions I, um, I know in, in Brazil of all places that are paramount and important, questions of species loss and tipping points for ecosystems, whether it's the Amazon basin or other protected regions there are many efforts to try to design marine protected areas or terrestrial protected areas to preserve not only the species there, but the key and critical ecosystem services that ecosystems provide, whether it's mangrove protecting against uh, surges of water, filtering of water quality by oyster beds, and all sorts of other ways, or viewing nature for nature's sake. We know that right now that there are many ways in which ecosystems are threatened and trying to understand connectivity and tipping points is obviously key. In my view, quantitative models and methods are needed across all these scales. We're not just going to be taking observations and reporting back. We're integrating observations in terms of theory, using theory to both understand, get principled understanding, but also to develop tools to try to make change, not just being passive onlookers or bystanders in a different sense than I used before of changes that might be underway. And it's obviously apparent over the last three years how much models have played a role, both in terms of estimating how bad SARS-CoV-2 could be, trying to communicate the risk to the public at large, but also drill down and understand exactly what was going to happen, how human behavior might change as a result of feedback, what would be the right way and when and where to deploy vaccines or non-pharmaceutical interventions, and in some cases became controversial be precisely because they were placed <clears throat> in direct contact with public health and public decision-making. I will get back to this in the last section of some of our work in this topic, and Stephen Beckett will also talk about some of his ways in which we can use basic principles of epidemics to understand how disease might spread, what makes them particularly dangerous, and then how we may go about responding. So that will be one of the last sections we'll talk about in this module. Okay, so what are we gonna try to do in each one of these modules? And we're gonna go through four and I'll list them at the end. We want you to understand the important problem at stake. How do you translate that problem and set of biological mechanisms into a model? Choose parameters and do a little bit of pencil and paper work largely in class or with the help of the instructors on the board, and then implement them numerically and solve them and hopefully revise in light of differences. And given the time we have, we'll do a little bit less of that. We're not going to be assigning the kind of homeworks we typically do in the US, which require a lot more extra time and your days are already full. We get that, but at least give you a taste. And again, I wanna go back to what I view as the recipe for success here. And it comes down to methods and logic. And I'll just click through. Methods being the toolkit that you're going to develop. Getting better at coding and some basic mathematical moves. Improving your numeracy like having a sense of what numbers should be used in a particular kind of problem. Learning to prototype. How do you develop a model very quickly and then quickly feedback if you need to change? And also things like logic. How do you think logically, which I view as quantitative reasoning given uncertainty, 
so that you're building a sense of dialogue. A dialogue can be with a partner. So when you're doing the laboratories, some of you are working Python and R, I recommend building a small group, you know, two or three maximum, of which you're using the same language, R or Python, and go through and have that dialogue to see how you're working through a problem. But as scientists, sometimes you have to have the dialogue with yourself and you have to set up your alternative hypotheses in a way that you can really eliminate one or the other, depending on what the evidence says. And to do that, you might want to use some scaling hypotheses, looking for signatures, and ultimately trying to do the scientific method, right? You build a model, you have a theory which is a translation of some biological measure mechanism. And then you're trying to look at measurements and compare. And that iterative process is how we make progress. Okay. Are there any questions at this stage, Fabio? I don't see any, and I don't see any on either screen. You can also talk on the microphone if <laughs> to answer, no? I have some more uh, specific stuff coming. I, again, with the intros and classes in the US, when I do my first class, there aren't that many questions either. We're still getting uh, getting settled and getting used to each other. So I'm not worried about it, Flavia. Let us let me just keep going a little bit more and maybe there'll be some questions at the end. Okay. <laughs> so there's going to be some ways in which <clears throat> This class is also going to have to bridge the divide between words and language, given the different fields. It's an interdisciplinary class. We may have different ideas of what words mean when I use them and when you use them. For example, evolution. The first term I really heard that in a class setting was in a stellar evolution class. Where you have the evolution of stars, and it's quite interesting. Right. Starting from a regular star, you can have all these different ways in which over time they change into things like dwarf stars, or even a black hole. But of course, this is not a stellar evolution class. This is quantitative ecology and evolution. So when I say evolution, I mean any change in the genetic makeup of individuals in a population over generations. So it's a heritable change. It can be passed on from mother to daughters in a population. And we can have some differences that accumulate over time. Notice I haven't said anything about evolution via natural selection yet. I haven't said survival of the fittest. I haven't said anything about it. For all I know, there's no difference between these individuals but perhaps just through chance, through neutral drift, some allele, some type might be more present in the next generation than the current one. I will still call that evolution. There's also the related idea of evolution via natural selection, which is any non-random change in the genetic makeup due to the differential reproduction and survival of individuals. So maybe some individuals are better at surviving, some are reproducing, maybe both. And because of those differences, we see a potentially even directional change in how many individuals of type A there are in the population. Oftentimes, people, usually from outside biology, conflate the second definition with the first. And we will focus on many ways in which there's strong selection. Like a virus attacking a cell is very strong selection. If the cell is infected, it might die. So therefore, a genetic change leading to resistance could lead to a massive differential survival and then later on reproduction. So you can see why that can be of interest. But evolution need not have that non-random change. It need not have that differential reproduction. It could just be by chance. The other thing I want to say here is that when we're talking about evolution, I haven't even mentioned de novo mutations. For all I know, there's already standing variation in the population. And the evolution is happening simply by the change in the relative number of type A or B or 
different types of genotypes in the population. In the long term, all of these things operate. There are new mutations that lead to novelty. There's evolution via natural selection. And there's also sometimes just neutral drift and random change. So I bring this up as one example because it's so core, but also because there may be words that are used by Jacopo and Stephen that we think you know, or we think you know what we mean by the word, but maybe you don't, or maybe you're unsure. You should ask the question. Okay. It's better to kind of have that dialogue, especially in interdisciplinary class, it's likely someone else also has a similar question. Okay. There will be a number of words and concepts that we're going to be returning to over the next month, like programming, nonlinear, networks, complex system, and multi-scale. I'm going to go through each one. This class is going to get much more exciting in the next month when Jacobo and, and Stephen take over. Uh, but I want to go through each one and then also give you one example of multi-scale as a bridge to what I hope you're going to experience in the modules. So first of all, program. All of you have now done some programming. And you are at least familiar with MATLAB, Python, or R. Maybe some of you like C or Perl or Fortran. I don't know. Or you want to write this whole thing in assembly. That's fine. We are going to support MATLAB, Python, and R, which I think is already enough. And my point here is the language doesn't matter that much. My first paid job was programming in Fortran 77. And that was a long time ago. And I was supposed to analyze images for the US Navy. They had this little high school program for students who knew how to code. Though I, it's not entirely true. My first job, I, I think I got a penny per paper uh, for a little paper route of an older boy in my neighborhood. He would throw the papers, but if the hill was too high, he would send me up and he would give me a penny. Um, I didn't do that job for very long, but I do remember it. It's the act of encoding a process algorithm or a model into a language, right? And, and it's, it's something that when we start doing things, I know it's obvious, but even the command x equals three, right? It's not, is x equals three? x equals three? It's I take the thing on the right-hand side and assign to the left-hand side. So we're going to be encoding ideas and increasingly more complicated ideas spanning both deterministic systems, things in which the future is preordained if we knew all the parameters, to stochastic systems, to models that include individuals, to those in which we neglect the presence of individuals and think about everyone as a whole, and then in some cases comparing the two, which will be exciting, I hope. My view is that the language, again, doesn't matter that much. It's more about, are you getting the logic right? And as you will see, the structure of the code and the different languages will look very similar. We only ask that you choose one flavor and stick to it over the modules. And there was at some point on Twitter, a hashtag, my first seven languages. And I don't know, those are mine. Most of these days, I, I program mostly in MATLAB with some other things. Um, and I must ask because it's on the news. Has anyone ever heard of ChatGPT? Who has not heard of ChatGPT? Oh, fascinating. Okay, this is fascinating. So I know ChatGPT is a very good programmer. It is an AI, open AI tool. I have used it recently because I couldn't remember some bash scripting stuff that I need to do uh, for myself. And I used, I asked it a question like, tell me the command. I would rather you not use ChatGPT and just talk to the others. Now that I've told you about ChatGPT, everyone's going to use ChatGPT, but it's fine. You should at least be aware that it exists. Try to talk to people in the class and work through it. You'll probably move along faster anyway. But it is interesting to see how it approaches things. And actually, I don't see it as a major problem. If you get stuck on syntax at some point, it's like Stack Overflow, right? It's a resource. 
but we want you to be doing your own coding in the class. The other major concept that will recur is something called nonlinear or nonlinearity. Very simply, this is the Oxford English Dictionary definition. It's when that some magnitude of an effect or output is not linearly, literally not linearly or proportionally related to the input. We have some input, we have some output, and it doesn't go like this. It goes like that, or it goes like that, right? It saturates or it goes up. In biology, this means that the rate, and we also often talk about nonlinear models, not in terms necessarily always of their output, but of the interaction rules. So the Locke of Volterra model had something in which, and I don't think, let me see, can I do something? This will be dangerous. Oh. We had something like this, where as you can see, now we have the product of two populations, and that made it nonlinear. Right? You can imagine in other circumstance, it might be some function like some hill function of X or Y, but just this product of X and Y, even though it's a bilinear system, it's still a nonlinear system. And almost all of the models we'll be playing with will be nonlinear. And some of the games we'll play will be to try to turn them back to linear things, which are easy, in order to learn something about the nonlinear system. And often we do that locally near a fixed point, some place in the system in which not much is going on, and then we try to take the nonlinear system and tweak it a little bit, make certain assumptions that will work for a while as a way, as a guide for what might happen. So just to point out again, you will see this in almost all the models we develop in the class. Okay. And hopefully let me now go back and now maybe it'll work. I don't know. I'm on, let's see, laser pointer. Great. Oh, now I have a laser pointer now. Oh, I didn't have that before. Okay. Good. The other thing that we're going to be talking about to some extent are networks. And although we'll probably be dealing with small networks, there are lots of examples of disease networks, host parasite networks, predator prey networks. The models that we're going to be building will be the basis for moving outwards to more complex systems, right? In which these will be templates or ingredients that could be replicated by many individuals. So just for you to keep in mind, that if you were to go farther in this field, you could take these very ideas, but then extend them in ways in the directions of networks and network science. The other idea I want to point out here, and you should ask Jacopo about this because there's a Nobel Prize, the first Nobel Prize for complex systems. He didn't win it. If he did, he might not be teaching this class, but he might win one one day. Maybe you will win one day. And the first complex systems award was given to Parisi. This is an example by uh, Bach, Tang, and Wiesenfeld, and I included that. It's a very famous sand pile model. Also, Kurt Wiesenfeld is a colleague here at Georgia Tech. The ideas of complex systems are that you can have a property that emerges at the aggregate scale that is not a feature of the individual scale. In other words, in the words of P.W. Anderson, more is different. Right? It's not you get more of the same, you get something different. And complex systems usually feature many interacting agents with nonlinear relationships, some sort of feedback that are not sitting in equilibrium, in which sometimes they could have some long term memory, but certainly have some modular multi scale feature. And the last part is that there's some emergent property. In this sand pile model, the idea is that you add grains of sand, it grows and grows and grows, it reaches some level at which point you have a small avalanche, <clears throat> but at a certain point it can grow and the avalanches get arbitrarily large. So you reach this critical point where the size of the avalanches don't have a characteristic size, but can be in principle of infinite size. And so you get this scale-free phenomenon that there's no particular size or preferred size of this sand pile, nor of the avalanches. 
And the system organizes itself as not something that you can feature. It's not a feature of the individual grains. It's really a feature of the pile. There are some issues with that. It wasn't quite right in many ways, but it captured something important uh, about complex systems. The last thing I wanna to go to, and this will be my last example. And Flavia, I'll try to wrap up in the next five or 10 minutes or so, leaving a few minutes for questions. My expectation was this was a 75 minute period. Is that right? Uh, you, you have until, you have 35 minutes more. Oh, 35 minutes. Okay, yeah. I was, well, I'm only gonna go for about 15 minutes more. That's fine. <laughs> it, we'll, we'll have, we'll either have a little extra time on the break. Uh, anyway, it's the first class. <laughs> so, I want to go through one other issue of multi-scale methods and logic, which is that problems in biology almost always can open the door to another problem. And I've taken this series of images <clears throat> from Rob Phillips' beautiful book, Physical Biology of the Cell. Some of you may have seen it before. And this is an example of uh, the organization of a tissue which is a complex arrangement of cells in many different kinds. You might imagine some epithelial layer, maybe in the lungs or somewhere else. And as you can see here, we have scales of millimeters even to centimeters. But if you drill down and you look, you can see that although there's this complicated arrangement, the layers of cells are mostly of the same type and they create a regular structure. You can imagine this could be the epithelium of a lung tissue. And this could be quite important to protect against infections. And this now we've drilled down one order of magnitude. So we're now at the 100 micron scale. And if we go down, you can see that the epithelial itself is interesting. It has many internal features, organelles, whether membrane bound or not, and it responds to the environment in all sorts of interesting ways, including to the potential danger of pathogens. And although I've shown E. coli here, probably in the lungs, it's more of a danger of something like Pseudomonas aeruginosa or other lung pathogens, which can live in the environment, but also infect us. And when we get to this scale, you can see now we're at the micron scale. And this is obviously interesting for all sorts of reasons. First of all, bacteria are interesting organisms on their own. They can signal, they can detect things in the environment. They can move towards chemoattractants and away from chemorepellents. There's this very interesting dynamics of how they turn on their flagella via run and tumble mechanism. So when things are good, they extend their runs and all turn counterclockwise, the flagella, which allows them to go forward. And then they get a signal which makes the flagella go unbound. And when they're unbound, they stop immediately because there's basically no inertia at this scale. If they're not swimming, they're not moving. And then they can restart and move off in a new direction. So there's a whole beautiful series of studies of the basis for essentially the nanobrain of E. coli. But I wanna point your attention to this little thing sitting on top, because if we were to drill down even further, we would see that there's a whole nother series of studies we could get into on the subject of bacteriophage. And we will address the question of phage later on in these lectures. These are viruses that parasitize bacterial cells. They're often considered a predator of bacteria, but fundamentally they're a parasite. And even the word bacteriophage, the phage, the word phage comes from Greek phagos, meaning to devour. So these were first discovered about 100 years ago as things that seem to be smaller than bacteria, but nonetheless could devour them. In the end, obviously, it was later discovered that these were viruses and that they were very specialized uh, and they didn't eat, but rather infected and then turned bacteria cells into these virus factories, spitting out many hundreds of viruses to the environment. In other words, microbes get sick too. And if we were to zoom in even further, into the head of the bacteriophage, you would see there's wonderful physical biology questions. How does the genetic material get inside? How is it packed? How does it come out? There's a process by which both there's the self-assembly of the capsid, but also 
the genetic material has to enter and then leave. And it has to leave in the right location, right? It has to leave when it comes in contact with a target cell and not just when it runs into some debris into the environment. So these are metastable states, but they're stable enough to reach a new bacterial cell and can last for many hours, many days, and at low temperatures, many months or years, right? Or thousands of years, depending on where they're found. And if we go even further, we could get back to the original work of Watson, Crick, and Franklin on the double helical structure of DNA. And if we were really crazy, we might even get in all the interesting different features. And if we were chemists, maybe we'd even try to come up with alternative bases, which some chemists uh, now try to do for all sorts of interesting reasons. Right. So we just went across, and if I just go backwards the other way, I could zoom out and zoom back in, right? Over more than six order of magnitudes and scales and have interesting biological problems at each scale. I could have also zoomed out even further, right? gone not just from the organism, but to populations and communities as a whole. So the last thing I wanna talk about before going through what we're gonna do in the class is just to make one more point on bionumeracy. If we don't build models, we're probably unlikely to ask the questions of numbers, meaning if each story in biology is sort of a mechanism, but without necessarily a model that makes a specific quantitative prediction, we don't need numbers, right? We just say like, this happens, this binds to this, and then this other thing is produced, or predators interact with prey and they go down, but by how much? Do we have any ability to make quantitative predictions? So just to point out that if you're gonna go in the direction of building quantitative models, you're going to get into this question of, trying to identify, estimate, or utilize key numbers. And what is key depends on scale, right? So if we're talking epithelial cells, or E. coli, or phage, or questions of genome sizes, mutation rates, all of these will be relevant depending on, on the kind of question you ask. I'm not asking you to memorize any of these numbers. But I will ask Jacopo, we're going to have to make sure that the Google Drive contains this and a few other references. I hope it can be a gateway to your interest in this kind of topic. There's a bio numbers effort. Uh, uh, Ron Milo, Rob Phillips, Uri Alon, here Uri Moran, but a number of folks really led by Ron Milo at the Weizmann Institute have been pushing very hard on compiling appropriate numbers that can be used when you build models to really keep that as part of your practice. And once you discover that these kind of uh, little helpful sheets exist, you will find that you turn to them quite a bit. So I'm just gonna give this as one example and we'll give you references so you can find more. Okay. So I'm now gonna get into the last stages here of putting these lectures into context. At Georgia Tech, we do a full semester class called Foundations of Quantitative Biosciences. And you're here in the introduction. We're gonna skip all this stuff here. It's cool, but that's not what we're gonna do. The other thing we typically do in the first week is to use some time for paper discussion and then use some time as a primer for coding. My understanding from Flavian is that you're already there. You've already done some coding. And I think you've already had some basic introduction. So we're not going to do these other two components, but rather go right into what is our third module. And although we, we've reorganized the order and we've added one new section, really focus on things having to do with ecology and evolution. Just to give you a sense of how we organize the class. And then I'll explain what you're going to do. In the full semester class, so if you're interested, you can look for the book in about a year, or maybe you'll find it at a university near you if folks want to adopt it. Or you come to Georgia Tech or others, UCLA is using the class as well, and we're hoping to, to get it adopted by other places. We start with the Luria Delbert question, 
of whether mutations are dependent or independent of selection. And it turns out the answer there has all to do with fluctuations. And at its core has to do with a mathematical model of how resistance may arise and even pre-arise even before the selective threat is presented. We keep on that theme of fluctuations through ideas of bistability and gene regulation, and even through evolution, so classic models of neutral evolution. Later, we go into questions of organismal behavior and physiology. How do organisms like E. coli respond to good and bad regimes? And they do so by filtering noise at some level. And that brings up issues of other ways that information uh, that cells can do information processing like in neurons and how that kind of information processing can cascade to tissues and even lead to large-scale movement. So this second section really is all about organismal behavior and physiology. The last section is where you're going to be uh, focusing on with us for the next month it has to do with populations, evolution, and community. Jacobo Marchi will be starting, and I'll go through in a moment precisely what he'll be doing, and then followed by Stephen Beckett. But there are beautiful problems here, and, and Jacopo will guide you through questions of collective behavior, how individuals, first of all, make decisions, and how those decisions get changed when groups come together. And after that, we'll get into questions of predator-prey dynamics, so maybe not when the groups are all playing nicely, like European starlings, but maybe antagonistically like predator and prey. And finally, to this questions of epidemics, where I'll be doing a series of lectures and Stephen will be doing a few more. So I will come back and give you a few more lectures on the theme of epidemics, both from some of our theoretical work, but also ways in which we've used our theoretical work as a means to do interventions. Okay, this was a lot, a lot of background, but hopefully it gets you in the right mood. Jacobo, you see there, maybe he's in front of Iguazu for all I know. Jacobo, were you in front of Iguazu there? Oh, just a second, Jacobo, talk here. Yes. And will you admit to be on, being on the Brazilian or are the Argentinian side? I have photo? to admit it was the Argentinian side. That's what I was uh... worried about. <laughs> Okay, so that's Jacopo visiting Iguazu, but they're, both sides are beautiful. And Stephen Beckett, who will be next on the second part. Right now it's February 6th. We typically will have an hour and a half for each class, but mine's an introduction. Sorry, Flavia, I can't do an hour and a half of just straight introduction. I'm, we're, I'm, I've budgeted for about an hour and 10, and I think I'm right on track for with a few minutes, and you'll have a few extra minutes of coffee, and I'm also happy to, to have more questions. We will do four modules. Module one, in essence, will be evolutionary game theory. How do individuals make decisions when thinking, whether cognitively or in, simply in response to incentives, given that other individuals will also be making decisions? So Jacobo will start you off tomorrow with an introduction to evolutionary game theory and really to the theory of games in the eco-evolutionary context. The module has three days. We will get into a theme with some variants of having the first two being theory and lecture based. And the last, and I think tomorrow will be more interactive actually, because there's quite a lot of games you will get to play. And the last class being one in which you're going to do a computational lab. Now, in Georgia Tech, the labs typically last for two and a half hours. Here, they're an hour and a half, which means they're a bit abbreviated. We have therefore tried to recognize that in a few cases where we think the labs take a little bit more time to actually space those out into a two-day period. In the game theory one, we think we've, we're also going to do probably, and we'll just see how it goes, is to make sure that you have the instructor version of the solutions available to you. We encourage you to not look at them, but if you get stuck, it'll make sure that you can keep things moving. So you're gonna get two lectures on game theory, evolution and game theory, and then a lab. 
And then on Friday of this week, Jacob will start you on a new topic on spa spatial groups and flocking. Continue next week before Carnival. And the spatial model there is more intense. So we expect two laboratories for that one. Is that right, Jacobo? Yes, so um, I'll give you a more detailed outline uh, tomorrow, but uh, that's pretty much correct, yes. Good. Uh, and then Jacopo will hand over to Stephen, who will give you two lectures on predator prey dynamics, both the ecology and the eco well, evolutionary dynamics. So, not thinking just about Laca Volterra, but we'll go back to that. Uh, trying to get through some of the basics of how these equations even are written, what, how, what they're based on, uh, but also into questions of what happens when predator and prey evolve, right? so that their behaviors change as a result of mutations, and they have different sorts of interactions. And so that will be the subject of that Thursday and Friday lecture. And then there's the carnival break. And after carnival, Stephen is going to do sort of as a gateway, a special seminar on open release of code. And uh, I hopefully that will be interesting to many. How do you publish not just papers, but code? And he has quite a lot of experience in it. He has a new paper in the Journal of Open Source Software. He has been a lead code developer on multiple projects, both in the network arena, but also in the epidemics arena. So hopefully this gives you a nice uh, sort of translational professional development seminar. And then on the 23rd and 24th, that Thursday and Friday after Carnival, he will lead two laboratories, one of which focuses on the very basics of how predator and prey interact and the functional response at an individual level. And the second one on eco-evolutionary dynamics, what new dynamics can arise when predator and prey themselves change at the same time scale as populations change. That will be module three, and Stephen will give his own introduction when he is there in person. And then in the last module, the last week, I will give a double lecture on February 27th on epidemic principles through the lens of SARS-CoV-2, sharing the basics of what we expect epidemics to do and how they unfold, but also ways in which SARS-CoV-2 defied many of those expectations and ways in which we tried to use principles as a form of mitigation. And in the second lecture of that day, I will go beyond some of the basic models to give you a taste of some of the ongoing interesting problems in epidemic modeling through the lens of, I think, heterogeneity and behavior change. So I will give one lecture like this with slides and one that's more on the board. I realize I won't be there physically, but I will be able to use uh, a mouse-driven approach to kind of go through a lot of this with you, and hopefully that works. And then you'll get two laboratories where you're going to build your own epidemic model, including a deterministic and a stochastic model. And then I believe Stephen has one more lecture, which will again be on this theme of, of coding, uh, in terms of how did he developed, along with our group and collaborators, a series of computational models, including dashboards, that became an important part of awareness campaigns in the U.S. to try to raise awareness of the risk, uh, particularly of asymptomatic transmission indoors. That is the overview of what you're going to do. There are four modules. Each is self-contained. Each one will involve lectures and a laboratory with a reminder that you can do it. So I believe that's my last slide. We're excited to bring this material to you and work with you on it. As I said, Jacobo was a co-instructor in the foundations class and has been to Brazil before teaching this class last year. Stephen was a co-developer of many of our epidemic models and has taught in our foundations class as well. This is Stephen's first visit to Brazil. He's very excited to be there. Jacobo has been now a few times. Collectively, this is our third time teaching in different capacities. So we're happy to participate and be part of your experience in this ICTV SAFR training program.
So with that, it's 8.15. I'm happy to take some questions. And maybe I'll stop sharing that way if people want to raise their hand, I'm more likely to see you. So let me see if I can stop sharing. Hey guys, any questions? We have one online, it seems, from Go Gabriella ahead, and maybe... Gabi, I, think... yeah, I took off this because I don't think it has microphone. My question is actually about the workshop you mentioned. Are you listening? Okay. It's the workshop you mentioned. I couldn't find it. I tried to Google it quickly and I couldn't find it specifically. Could you, could you say the name of it again? The name of the work, two-day workshops intensive that you mentioned? Uh, yeah, they are... I'll put it in the chat. There are hands-on okay. few bios workshop. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can find one. We we went through a new website redesign, and so sometimes anyway, I'll I'll have to look for it a little bit later. I'll find one example of it and I'll put it. They're called the hands-on Q bios modeling workshop. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. If I can, I'll, I'll put one into the chat. Okay. Here's last year's. And okay. Probably... Thanks. Perfect. Okay. That was it. <laughs> For now. questions from the room. Um, make the question the mic. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, and just say your name. All right. Well, My name is Thiago. Uh, I'm a physicist by training, and I think it will be clear. <laughs> when I ask my question. Uh, you mentioned self-organized criticality. Uh, are there any examples in biology? I, I saw something regarding the human brain, but that was all I, I saw from it. Ah, the human brain, it, it perched the criticality in that Quantum Magazine article that you just read. Right, yes, I read that too, it was very interesting. Uh, and it mentioned the Santa Fe Institute. Some of the idea of self-organized criticality has often to do with uh, systems that are poised in a scale-free way, meaning that they have no characteristic scale. And I think one example of it has to do with flocking. So, Jacobo, I don't know if you're going to specifically mention the notion of scale-free in the flocking lectures, but that may be a good chance to bring it up. Yeah, we will, uh, we will talk about... Um scale-free behavior, I will not uh, speculate on what that means in terms of criticality or not for biological systems. Yes, so I, I, I think that the safer way is to say that the scale-free part has shown to be robust. Whether or not biology is self-organized at this critical point is a bit more controversial, but for the sake of the lectures, this notion that a system may not have a preferred scale is one that we see in biology. Flocks do it, and we can look for examples of it in terms of essentially the correlation length, how long a distance uh, things tend to have the same correlated direction of movement. And if there's not a characteristic scale, as we get a bigger and bigger flock, we should have longer and longer correlations. And we seem to see that. But Jakob will talk more about that. Good. Yes, next question. Uh, can you pass the mic here? Yeah. And then after Paula, yeah, okay. Go ahead, Amanda. Say your name and everything. <laughs> as, as Flavia just said, my name is Amanda. I am a mathematician by training. It's just a technical question. Um, I am. A, I use MATLAB, so, and <laughs> there was a joke about it because I'm the only one who uses it. But um, are we gonna have access to any sort of license to use it or should we already have it like I do? I mean, I don't, but. <laughs> Wait, you do or you don't have the license? Um, I have a, a version that is not no, you actually licensed. Yeah, that's okay. You don't have to tell me uh, any uh, details about the, how you got it or you didn't get it. Um, so, it will depend, and maybe you should talk to Jacopo. We have licenses that we could try to provide via either Georgia Tech or even through MathWorks. We've given us some licenses in the past for the purposes of courses. Uh, if you are the only one, note that Python and MATLAB are very similar, with the exception of the array indexing, you know, Python 0, MATLAB 1. Yeah. And we have 
the tutorials in the three languages. Yeah, we've been doing so, all our work in Python here in the course, but maybe someone here wants to use MATLAB for the first time, and I'm really up for it. <laughs> okay, well then, if that's the case and someone needs licenses, you have to let me know, and we'll have to see if we can get you a license, okay? Okay, thank uh, you. There is Octave as an alternative, but it gets a little tricky, so if you're alone, maybe it'll be better to use Python. If you if there are two people who want to use MATLAB, then ping me. I'll see what I can do on a license. I, I can't guarantee it. And that has been often the barrier, which is why we ended up translating the materials into these open source languages that have less barriers for access. Okay, thanks. And also just a feedback, it also it all seems very exciting about this course. It's going to be nice. <laughs> Thank you. I'm excited. I Jacobo is excited. Steven's also excited. Paula, do you have the mic? Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, I don't think you can see me from the camera. Let me move a little bit. Okay, I only see half the room. There you are. Yes, there hello. you are. Uh, my name is Paula. I'm a biology undergraduate. And I was curious when you talk about the networks that we will be studying the concept of networks in the course. And I wanted to know what kind of networks are we going to be studying? Are we going to maybe learn the basics to maybe make some sort of network on on programming or of sorts? Yeah, so I mean, that maybe was a bit of, that's the one slide. I was like, oh, I guess maybe overselling the networks a little bit. I, we will introduce the concept of host parasite networks and prayer prey networks, but we will not be doing things like using Cytoscape or other network programs or softwares. We won't dive down as much. If you're interested in that, Stephen, I'll, I'll talk to him before he leaves because he has done quite a lot of work on bipartite networks. And so in the lectures, we were gonna at least touch upon the notion of bipartite networks rather than unipartite networks. The idea that you can have a network of similar kinds of things which are called unipartite networks, or networks of different kinds of things, which are called bipartite networks, like predators and prey, hosts and parasites, pollinators and plants, and they can have different sorts of properties. So I will talk to them. We may, we can increase the, uh, the section that we touch upon those ideas in his lectures, if that's of interest to folks. I mean, there's some flexibility there. In doing so, we would probably talk more about common structures that we see in those networks. The ideas of modules and nestedness as things that emerge when we look at biological networks. We probably won't be doing as much of, anyway, more advanced mathematics on networks. We just don't have the time for that. But well, I hope that worry. helps. Yeah, I hope that helps. But we will try to bring up this notion of of basic structures and networks that are not just random structures and that recur in biological systems in the context of the host parasite side. I see, thank you. Uh, that would help very much. <laughs> I am very okay. interested in networks at least. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll make a note of that. We'll talk to Stephen about making sure that it appears. Thank you. Any last question, guys? There's one here. I will pass my mic. I think it's easier. <laughs> You're going to have to move into the left side. Or I can't hear you with the microphone. Yeah, she's good. Do you see me? Okay. I, yes. I guess you do. Um, I'm Laimara, and I'm an environmental scientist. And my question was just about um, it was my impression that we're going to have some classes about data visualization. Um, I wanted to know how deep are we going to dive into it, like dashboards and, and the other stuff. And the second question is about our assignments. Are we going to have a lot of assignments to be done out of class or they're it's usually in just in the lab? Yeah, so Flavia and I will discuss that, but my plan right now is for the laboratories to be largely completable in the time we've allotted. 
I know you have a lot going on. When I look at your days, it doesn't seem you have too much flexible time. So at present, I wasn't planning on assigning homeworks. If Flavia tells me I need to assign homeworks, we have homeworks ready to be assigned. Uh, the, yeah, they, by doing, yeah. I think they don't have time. Uh, they have a very tight um, yes. schedule. Uh, but if you want to give them the homeworks for them to study later, I think it's a great idea. Uh, the other professors did some of this, uh, but yeah, it's not like required, but if you can give them some of these homeworks, it's great. Okay, I'll take a note. That way, neither Flavia and I look bad, because if, if I said I wasn't going to give homeworks and Flavia said, yes, you have to give homeworks, then she she's the bad cop and I'm the good cop. I'm like, oh, I'm not. Good. I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't want to do it, but Flavia, she forces me. So I was not going to assign homework. We can give some challenge problems for your own interest for later, right? I'm happy to do that. We're not going to check it. The thing that I will want you to do is keep your own, whether it's Python notebook or R Markdown document or MATLAB code, please keep it because then if at some point, um, you know, Flavia and or I wants to just make sure that each one of you has done stuff, I'm going to ask for a copy, right? Also, it's good for us to get a sense of what's going on, what's working, what's not working. That was part one of the question. The other part of the question had to do with the visualization side. In 2021, in our epidemics uh, hands-on workshop, one of the tutorials was how to build your own dashboard. That was taught by people who do this professionally for a living. And we pay when we want to make our dashboards. We build prototypes, but the, we leave the full stack development to other groups. It's a bit more involved. And we were not going to cover it. We were going to cover some of the choices made to build dashboards, but more at the conceptual level, the implementation level. And then Stephen may dive down into some of the choices he did in developing open source software. So I was not planning on doing a tutorial. I just think it's a little bit too specialized and beyond even what we're really trained to teach and do. This involves some software engineering side of things. If it's of interest to anyone, including the, the, the individual who just asked the question, uh, I will track down because we have an open source example of how to do this in R. So if that's of interest, maybe Flavia, you can let me know and I'll track that down as a resource for people we can share on the drive. Yeah. Uh, do you want to say something, Laimara? Hmm? Oh yeah, Laimara is interest, so yeah. Um, there may I've be already... other I can put it on the drive. Yes, uh, I've already included Jakob on Drive and, and Slack. Uh, Joshua, do you want to enter as well where you can pass this material? Uh, I can't go on Slack. I will lose my mind, but please share the drive. <laughs> I will, okay. I, I, I'm happy to get emails. Yeah, <laughs> I'm very email. I, I still use uh, Pine for email. Most of you have never even heard of what that is, but that's what I use. <laughs> it's a text based email system. It keeps my life easier. Uh, so my email is available and I will uh, share. Actually, I think I might be able to share it right now. So I'm pretty sure. Are you? I'm trying to go there. If on that link, um, this may not have all, it may not have all the choices. Anyway, it's not quite all of it. Um, I'll track it down later, the full set. This is, this is a different one. Anyway, ignore that one. That's the wrong one. Yeah. I was just trying to track down one of our previous workshops, but it doesn't have the, um, software engineering side. I'll track that down later. Okay. 
And I think it's time. I think we've gotten to the uh, one and a half hours with the questions. Because there's always, that's the one other thing in Yakubo, you remember this from the past. One of the most fun things about this group, this course, is the uh, breadth and depth and interest in the questions. So keep it up, keep asking questions, and we'll try to make sure that the lectures always have a 15 minute buffer so there's uh, sufficient time for questions. Okay. Um, I'm here in the back part of the classroom. Can you see me now? Yes, I see you now. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Joshua. Uh, it would be amazing to have you back on the 27, I guess, 26, I don't remember. 27, Monday yeah. the 27th. I'll 27, be there for the and yeah. I'm sure Jakob and Steven will give a very great course here. Uh, thank you very much for being here, and see you soon. <laughs> see you, thank you, have fun. Enjoy. Thank you. We will. <laughs> ciao, ciao. Bye. <laughs> uh, hey, guys. Uh, just a quick message. Uh, the coffee break will be here in classroom number two. And just another quick message. Uh, the other class uh, you have after the break is uh, Karen Abbott that will be teaching. And you have two papers in the Google Drive that she recommended you to read. So it's there. And uh, Jakubu, Stephen, and maybe Joshua will be uh, 